Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our latest uh, coronavirus TV episode. Uh, thanks to Astrid for filling in yesterday. Really interesting topic on remdesivir and expanded access. Uh, today, on the 1st of April, I'm going to be talking about malaria drugs, somewhat reluctantly again. Um, it's a topic that is certainly kind of inescapable because of the amount of news it's generating. Uh, certainly is controversial um, and, and likely you know, there are plenty of people out there wanting to know more about this, especially on, and not least patients and physicians that are you know, needing uh, a treatment in the front line um, against COVID-19. Um, I am somewhat reluctant to bring it up again, um, simply because I feel like it hasn't necessarily, the story hasn't necessarily progressed a great deal since we last talked about it. Um, but considering the amount of misinformation out there, I do think it is important to talk about. So let's start by what we actually know. Um, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, its kind of better tolerated cousin, are both widely prescribed malaria drugs. Um, and uh, Chloroquine has been shown um, in vitro uh, to have an effect against novel coronavirus, and this data is published in a Nature journal. The exact mechanism is less clear. It might be something to do with raising cellular pH, um, but nevertheless, you know, the authors of this paper rightfully recommend that we start to look at these drugs in human clinical trials um, because you know, there is a potential effect there, so that's great. Um, so what do we know clinically? Um, as of today, I think that I'm aware of three separate clinical trials for which kind of data or the first um, manuscripts have been published. One of these is um, from a French group and two are from trials in China. Let's start, start first with the French group. Um, in this trial, we have data spanning around 80 patients that have all received hydroxychloroquine uh, with or without azithromycin. Um, in the trial, patients um, on average, I think, were able to be discharged from hospital within five days. Um, this doesn't tell us anything, though, because there was no comparator in this trial. So actually, we don't know how patients would have, would have fared otherwise. What's the actual effect of the drug? Um, also, the patients that were enrolled into this trial were pretty questionable. Um, a decent number of these patients were actually asymptomatic. So it really begs the question, how did these patients end up in hospital? How do these patients actually receive a test for COVID-19? Why were they given the drug? Um, yet they were included in the trial and that kind of, I guess, improves the outcomes of patients if you're you know, tracking very healthy, otherwise healthy patients. Um, so the trials in China, the first, um, first published data were from Zhejiang. Um, apologies for my pronunciation if that's wrong. Um, so in this trial, I think it was 30 patients across um, an active treatment and a placebo arm, which is great. Um, I think 15 patients in each. There was actually no, no significant difference between either um, chloroquine or placebo. And actually the placebo patients did slightly outperform chloroquine, although as I say, that wasn't um, significantly different. Um, most recently, and there's one that I've been reading about this morning and much more promisingly, is a trial out of Wuhan um, and the, that's, this trial has shown significant benefit for drug treatments um, after five days in terms of both fever, um, cough and pneumonia symptoms, um, significantly better than placebo. Total sample size was 62 patients. So that is, I'm hoping this result kind of supersedes the other two um, trials, which um, I suppose were either smaller in scale or had some, you know, pretty big design flaws. Um, so what's happening now, um, there are huge amounts of other trials ongoing, um, very, very promising that actually we, we aren't having to rely on interpreting these somewhat speculative trials. We should get more definitive answers coming up. Um, we also have manufacturers um, producing uh, or donating vast quantities of, of chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, um, and then also continuing to ensure global supply. Uh, I'm sure you hopefully will have also seen as well, the US FDA has actually provided emergency use authorization for the use of hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine in COVID-19 um, in patients that aren't able to get it otherwise. So this is essentially a, a, an approval, which is um, unprecedented. Uh, so at the moment, the clinical picture is somewhat mixed. Um, I was less positive until reading about the most recent trial out of Wuhan today, but it's still you know murky. Um, 
Mm, so the Novartis CEO, Vaz Narasimhan, is um, one behind the manufacturer, one of the manufacturers of this supply, and his expectation is that um, we should have much more clinical trial data over the next month. So that is the time frame we are looking at. Um, so um, in addition to these trials that are kind of measuring the effect of um, these antimalarials as an antiviral as patients are infected, there's also some other um, treatment settings that are interesting. Uh, and most, um, I think the one I want to talk about is that this post exposure prophylaxis. So this is testing um, the chloroquine in um, potentially healthcare workers that are exposed to COVID-19 regularly, but haven't yet um, developed symptoms. So can we prevent um, these, these, um, these otherwise healthy people from, from developing the virus? Um, so there are quite a few trials ongoing that are, because it's a prophylaxis trial, you kind of need larger, larger samples in order to measure the effects. Um, but yeah, universities of Minnesota, uh, Columbia, and also Oxford here in the UK are running such studies of healthcare workers. Um, if these work out, um, fingers crossed they do, then this will enable us to treat the coronavirus much more aggressively in a new treatment setting. So this would, for the first time, give us a drug treatment option that can effectively lower the viral reproduction rate. Um, this would be essentially the number of people that an affected person goes on to pass on their virus to. Um, stay, um, do, do make, uh, do pay close attention to this um, uh, and anything you read about chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine as the picture emerges. Again, exercise caution as to what you're actually reading about. Is this, you know, where is the trial being run? Is there a comparator arm? Are there large numbers of patients? Um, we should certainly be very, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat perhaps on the negative, more negative side of things and perhaps a bit more pessimistic um, than there might be cause to be. I don't misinterpret that. I really do hope these trials work out, but the, um, the scientific evidence kind of that you would normally build in order to kind of make the justification of running larger and larger clinical trials just doesn't exist here but then there is still a huge need to run that um, to run these trials so i don't i don't disagree with um the need to, to exploring this and i do hope it works out it may well be that um, chloroquine is effective um and the one benefit of, of this drug is that we do have the um, global manufacturing in place and the ability to scale up to meet demand as the virus spreads. So this is a very appropriate treatment option as it is currently. Um, it may well be superseded by um, a more effective antiviral further down the line, and, and that's fine. That's great. We need we, we we do need really effective antivirals, um, but we also need effective antivirals now, even yesterday. And this is where. Um, these malaria drugs may fill that void. Uh, somewhat rambling a little bit today. Um, hope you've been able to follow and found it interesting. Um, I look forward to catching up with you guys um, over the next uh, few days as well. Bye now.